um, a listener says they enjoyed listening to the show very much. And would you explain further what you meant when you said last week you must earn Kundalini? Okay, I believe the question that Sintara just said, because the sound isn't coming through well, the question was, what do you mean when you say that you must earn the Kundalini? What I mean by that is, in many respects, uh, a person having Kundalini, and, and you know, we'll assume for the moment that they don't know that they're having Kundalini, uh, will typically resist the many phenomena that that comes uh, associated with it. Uh, everything from uh, what we're going to be talking about today, spontaneous movements, spontaneous vocalizations, things of that nature. You know they will they will fall into fear and they will resist these phenomena. And what I mean by you must earn the kundalini is the is the fact that you must give over control of your body of your life of the control of your body of the control of your life to the kundalini and uh, a a form of exquisite. Surrender. Now, if you have a, a teacher, a uh, uh, person who has awakened Kundalini at this point, uh, some people, and, and I find it to be very effective, if they, instead of visualizing the Kundalini within themselves, which can be very uh, impersonal, non physical, and difficult to visualize at times as an actual consciousness. Uh, if you are able to to surrender to the teacher, and you know this is this has got to be a teacher that you you have real uh, positive trust in. Uh, you can surrender to that teacher, as many in the East do already. Uh, you know they they will have their guru or their teacher, and they will surrender to that teacher as a way of surrendering to the kundalini within themselves. Here in the West, uh, you know, we don't have, we don't, we don't have a, a high comfort level for teachers. We have a higher comfort level for the, the, uh, the spiritual aspects of, of, of a consciousness. And so uh, we'll surrender to God, but we don't really know what God is. Or we'll sw- surrender to a, an ideology or a religion or things of that of that nature. Uh, in the West, it is more difficult. And yet, if you do have that teacher in your life, that flesh teacher, the teacher that is alive right now, and uh, they are of a trustworthy capacity for you, then then I would definitely look to surrendering to your kundalini using that teacher as a conduit. Um, and so this is what I mean by, by earning the kundalini. Uh, you will have to go through different levels of surrender, different levels of giving over the control of your life, the control of your body, the control of your mind, you know, the control of your emotions. You know, one day, as we'll discuss later on today, you, you may just start crying for no reason at all whatsoever. You have no reason to cry, and there you are, crying a puddle of tears. Well, this is another symptom of the Kundalini, and this is this is part of an aspect of of, of having to to earn the Kundalini by uh, giving yourself into it. So that's that's what I mean by that that first question. Uh, Santara, what was the next one? The same person would like to know if you would expand on what you meant by extreme forgiveness. Rather than forgiveness, yeah. Thank you, Santara. So once again, the question is, uh, you know, an expansion on the idea of extreme forgiveness. Extreme forgiveness is is a term that I use to describe difficult forgiveness. Often, when something happens to us in a in a negative context, uh, you know we may be able to just forgive lightly and gently and and move on. But, you know, 
extreme forgiveness is for extreme um, actions that require a deeper forgiveness. Um, Say somebody hit your child with their car. Well, that level of forgiveness for the person that that hit your child with their car is going to be different from uh, the forgiveness that you would give somebody who is cutting you off on the freeway. It's a level of, of the extremity of, of what has occurred that would cause uh, forgiveness to be used. So extreme forgiveness, you know, goes along with extreme events. And also uh, to yourself as well. Uh, if you have done something that you feel is terrible, that you feel is is, is very, very uh, hard for you to let go of in, in the matter of guilt. Uh, you, you must forgive yourself as well. You, you know, and he, as extreme as the situation may be, as extreme as the as the action that you may have committed may be, you still must match the extremity of the action with an extreme level of forgiveness. Was there another one, Santana? There is, Chris. Um, where is it? Is super consciousness or the I am the same as Kundalini? No, no. Uh, super consciousness, I am, uh, is still outside of of the uh, understanding of what it is to be divine. Uh, it's still connected to the human uh, ideology of awareness and of, uh, you know, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, Kundalini is different. Kundalini, Kundalini's transformation within you can indeed uh, open you up to your I am awareness, but it can it actually goes even further than that. It opens you up to divine awareness. Divine awareness is one of the highest states of consciousness that a human being can enter into and still reside within a living physical body. Uh, Were there other questions from the last show? There was one more, cousin. Thank you. It is, um, why does karma get balanced in childhood? Ah, yes, that's very important. When we're children, we're absolutely helpless people. We have no control or very little control over what happens to us in our lives. Uh, We... You know, we're like baby ducks walking across a freeway sometimes. Um, Gruesome uh, picture that may be. Uh, We are subject to the winds of change that we have very little control over. And this is a perfect environment for karma to be be dispensed. Uh, And so many of the kundalini people... Uh, in their childhood will have very, very, very difficult childhoods. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes they'll be abused physically, sexually, uh, depending on, on the circumstances of that person's life, the circumstances of that person's karma. So when we're a child, we have no choice but to surrender. you know, from a karmic level. We really have no choice. I mean, we will scream and we will cry and we will run and we will hide and, you know, we will do everything that that the human, the young human person would do, but karma you can really not escape. And so we will have that karmic uh, clearing happen to us as a child because we have no choice about it. 
you know, this is a very, childhood is a very, very, very special time in a person's life, as we all know. Uh, but we are, we, are, we are most susceptible to outside forces when we're a child. We are most susceptible to not being in control of our circumstances. And it's that uh, expression of not being in control that allows karma to be given and karma to be experienced and balanced in, in the small in the, in the small child. As the person ages, they gain more control, and the karmic awareness will shift, shift into a level that that deals with a person that has more control. Uh, the laws of karma are very, very strong and very, very real. And it's not something that the person is unaware of. Uh, you're unaware of it to the degree that you're behind the veil of knowing why your your karma is a certain way. You know, and, you know, many people say, oh, gosh, you know, this, this bad and terrible thing happened to me, and therefore I must have a, a bad and terrible karma. Well, well, not so uh, sure, sure. There's, there's a possibility that a person has a, a bad and terrible karma, and yet the whole idea of karma in the lifetime of a person is for it to become balanced, for the debt to be paid. And those payments will be very, very, very short or very, very, very long, depending on what it is that the person's karma is balancing for them within their life. Uh, as a child, it's the, it's a greater level of balancing that is achievable than an adult who may resist that karma, you know, and in, in a sense build more karma. Children are so innocent, you know, uh, you know that it's difficult for them to build new karma because of that innocence. And so it gives gives the child the availability of of focusing unintentionally, focusing on dealing with the current situation as it is, however it is, in their lifetime. And that is how the children will balance their karma in early life. Sintara? Okay. Thank you, Chrism. Th those are the questions from last week. Okay. There's no um, more. Yeah, I would like to uh, give the numbers out again. Uh, uh, we're still having a, a little bit of an issue, it, it seems, with uh, with the sound quality. Uh, I believe you had John, uh, your husband John, uh, uh, looking into how the sound is coming through. Could you ask John if it's coming through all right? I, John says that you're coming through fine and I have got better. That was the last report. I, I wasn't. You were fine the whole time, Chrism, but mine was a bit bollough, he said, which means sort of vibrating a little. But I'm okay now too, I think. Am I okay, John? No response. I'm sure if, if he let us know. Can you, can you give the numbers out again? I can. I'm fine. He just said, we're fine. We're coming across fine. <laughs> okay, so the number is 347-934-0026. And you can ring at any time, and we will be delighted to hear from you. Okay. Uh, the topic of this show is spiritual psychic phenomena uh, associated with the Kundalini. This is, this, this, I won't be able to fit everything in within a, an hour and a half uh, show. Uh, I want to cover some of the main uh, spiritual phenomena that can occur for a person having the Kundalini. Uh, one of the first things I want to cover is that Kundalini is not linear in how it dispenses its uh, symptoms to the individual. A plus B does not equal C. One plus one will not always equal two. Sometimes it'll equal 11. Sometimes it'll equal 
railroad tracks or an equal sign. It is not a linear, logical uh, experience much of the time. And so if you're looking at it within that context, I will invite you to to wi widen your ability to to uh, consider the Kundalini in, in, a, in a broader context. It is not always logical and linear, and yet sometimes it is. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to encourage you to, to open to all possibilities, uh, all strange possibilities that, uh, that may occur to you within the context of, of moving towards the Kundalini, say moving towards a spinal sweep, which is a spinal sweep, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the energy collecting at the base of the spine, and it's actually the three, last three vertebrae of the tailbone. And the energy will begin to permeate the, the bone uh, in the pelvic regions, and it will permeate that bone in a way that causes a person to have pressure at the base of the spine. This pressure can feel very, very, uh, it can be felt very clearly. And in some ways it can be a bit painful at times for the, for the person who is, who is just beginning to awaken to Kundalini. The pressure can build, it can build, it can build, it can build. And it'll build so much uh, uh, and with such severity that a person may seek out medical assistance. And the medical community will look at that and go, oh, geez, you know, let's, well, let's do a test here. Let's, let's do some, uh, let's take some pictures of it. Let's, you know, let's, let's do all the different measurements that we can do to see if there is a bone spur or a, or a, a problem in the, in the, in the lower, you know, spinal column. You know, and they'll go and they will do what they can do. And typically, they won't find anything, and, and it'll become a uh, diagnosis phantom pain, you know, which doesn't really help the person, but it, it gives uh, some sort of a context with it. This pressure that will build at the base of the spine is, is in reality a, a, a collection of kundalini that is permeating the bone and suffusing the bone with a higher, stronger, faster level of, of energy than what the body is normally used to. And as that, as that energy moves through the pelvic girdle into the, into the, uh, the lower spinal column, hearing that noise now, Centaur, are you doing anything? I just, somebody joined us to listen through their phone, and I just unmuted a mic. I think we're okay again now. Okay. So as the energy moves through the pelvic girdle, uh, it will begin to broaden itself in a kind of a, like a large pool at the base of the spine. Uh, once again, this, this is not always comfortable, and yet it is not always uncomfortable either. You know, this, this does not necessitate a pain response at all. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes just the strangeness of the symptom itself scares a person or frightens a person into feeling that it, you know, it is so strange and it's so frightening that, that therefore pain is created with regards to that. Now, as the, uh, as this, activation in the first chakra continues to expand. Other phenomena are going to also begin. You know, you, you know, you start hearing uh, sounds or, or uh, music or chanting or uh, unintelligible voices. Uh, you may start seeing movements in the corner of your eye that you you know, you turn your head and they're gone, but 
if you just look straight ahead in the corner of your eye, in your in your extreme peripheral vision, you'll see movement there, and you may even see shapes. Uh, this will often happen concurrently with the Kundalini activating within the first lower first chakra, so first chakra there. Uh, so it's not just one thing that will occur. There are actually many different things that will occur at the same time. Uh, Kundalini is a very, very dense layer of symptom when it first starts occurring for the person. And these symptoms go across the physical body, the mental body, the emotional body, the psychological body, and the spiritual body. All five bodies of the human expression will receive phenomena often at the same time. Okay, And so I will invite you to consider this. And, and if you're in the middle of a beginning kundalini expression, really, really relax. Allow this to occur. Don't resist. Don't go into fear if you can at all help it. And allow things to mature as as it's going to mature within you. Not everybody gets uh, a, a linear uh, kundalini activation either. Some people activate in different chakras. First, for instance, uh, one person may activate it at the tailbone. The other person may first activate at the heart. Uh, people who are experimenting with, with drugs or alcohol or, you know, other forms of, uh, of uh, recreational uh, chemicals, they may activate the, at the seventh chakra, and, and their process will force them to go from seven, six, or seven, five, six, three, two, four, one, things of that nature. And so people have different combinations. I do, within a teaching context, encourage people to go from the first chakra on up, and when I give Shakti Pot, I definitely go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Uh, many of the qualities of symptoms are, are quite exciting in a way. You'll, you'll, you'll actually hear the buzzing of bees. You'll hear the chirping of a million crickets. Uh, you'll hear. Uh, Animal sounds that are un they're they're not able to be distinguished by you or, or or labeled with oh that's a cat or oh that's a dog it'll sound something very very peculiar and because it is strange and because it is unknown you will typically have a fear response associated with it uh, in many in many cases uh, the kundalini will keep this up with you until you begin to get a bit used to it. And as you get used to it, your fear response will lessen. And in that lessening of the fear response, more kundalini symptoms can, can jump into the mix. It's a very, very, very exciting spiritual transformation, but it's not just spiritual. Remember, it's the five bodies of human expression that are all undergoing a transformation at the same time. Now, you know, in the in the in the in an extreme scenario, all five bodies will be having multiple different uh, expressions or symptoms concurrently. But it doesn't have to be that way either. Sometimes it can be one symptom for the physical, uh, another symptom for the mental, and that's all you'll get. Sometimes it'll just be with the emotional, and that's all you'll get. Sometimes it'll get. It'll be spiritual, mental, and emotional, and that's all you'll get. Sometimes it'll just be psychological and physical. So you see that the divine within you, the, the, the Kundalini divine, has a, a you know many, many, many options and combinations in how it delivers the symptoms to the person. And a lot of this will also, once again, follow a karmic pattern. Okay. Your karma um, mixed in with kundalini awakening will equal uh, a certain pattern 
of symptoms coming to you, things that you need to work on uh, as your kundalini is coming forward. So if a person is, let's just say a person is, uh, has a strong level of greed in their psyche, in their consciousness, and, you know, they're, you know they're, they exhibit, you know, very, very strong levels of greed, and yet, at the same time, you know, they're a very spiritual person, and, and uh, kundalini is coming to them. Well, in their dream life and in their, their waking life, the kundalini will bring to them examples of greed that they need to work on, and this will come through levels of symptoms. Uh, greed is often based within the the, uh, the equation of want of gain and fear of loss, and so it will it will help a person understand the uh, the challenges that greed brings to them through the fear of loss and through the desire or the want of gain, and so so consider this within your kundalini awakening context and. And see where uh, the Kundalini has been communicating to you about a certain issue in your life that uh, that maybe the Kundalini is asking you to work on. You have to remember this is not like electricity. This isn't like the wind, uh, at least in the way that electricity and the wind are understood in the Western societies. Kundalini is smart. It is intelligent. It has its own consciousness. So you, as a human being, you are a consciousness, and then there's another consciousness within that consciousness. And yet this Kundalini consciousness has a much more uh, specific agenda with you, which is to you know, transform you uh, within a divine agenda. So please remember that as I'm talking with you about these uh, these psychic symptoms and things of that nature. Kundalini knows you, knows you better than you know yourself. It knows you better than you know yourself. It knows your history. It knows your karma. It knows what you're feeling. It knows what you're thinking. I know it sounds like Santa Claus. <laughs> It does know you, and it knows you very, very, very well, and it knows what you need to do in order to accept in a greater way and in, and often in a, in, a, in a more balanced and, and enjoyable way. It knows what you need to do to have the kundalini have itself come into a greater expression within yourself uh, by unblocking some of these issues that, that you may have. And it's not just greed. It can be greed. It can be uh, laziness. It can be, you know, any any of the qualities of blockage that a person might go into uh, because, you know, because of their life or, or, or some of the uh, patterns of expression that they've, they've been coming into, you know, at this part of their life. You know, we make mistakes, and we learn from our mistakes, and we move on, and Kundalini recognizes those mistakes and helps you learn from them. Uh, some of these extreme symptoms will be, uh, I'll just start out with the emotional body, crying, a lot of crying. Uh, crying is not what we think it is. Crying is more a release valve for the body. Uh, it's giving the body the ability to release energy uh, when that energy becomes too much. Uh, like the little well, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to just show you how old I am right now. When my when my mother uh, was cooking for for her four children, uh, Spanish rice uh, back in the 60s, uh, she would use a pressure cooker sometimes. And 
on top of that pressure cooker was a little steam release valve that would release the steam from inside the pressure cooker, releasing the pressure, okay? Well, this is what crying does with the human body. It releases that pressure. So in many ways, crying is an absolute must. I will encourage you to allow those tears to flow. And if you have heavings of the body that are associated with those tears, let the body heave. Let yourself cry out loud. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, in the middle of the supermarket or at the gas station that, you know, you start weeping and wailing. Wait until you get into the car. <laughs> Allow yourself, you know, not to cause a, a scene. You know, people will see you crying, you know. Their, their sympathy and, and their, their consideration for you will, will, will come up. And so, um, and especially with family members, you know, if you if a family member or children see you crying, they'll think something's wrong. And, and so, if you can find a private time for you to have those tears. Nighttime is good for this. Nighttime is good for this, but also uh, just areas of, of of your day or night where you have privacy and you can cry. Uh, if you have a spouse or or you live with uh, housemates, roommates, family, whatever, uh, just explain to them what it is, that it's just uh, a level of emotional balancing uh, that, you're, that you're having. All is good. Don't worry. And, and thank you. Thank you so much for your concern. Uh, really, really allow the tears to come. Find a way to cry and be okay with it, especially you men. Men have a much harder time with crying than women do, and they'll resist it much stronger than a woman will. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a strength for women because they have the ability to release that energetic pressure from their system uh, with, with greater flow than, say, a man would because of how we're raised uh, in the West. And so, uh, men, I, I want to encourage you to really let the tears flow. In many cases, you'll have no option. The kundalini will force that flow no matter what, but I don't want you to resist it. Don't resist the tears. The tears are good. They are a good thing. They are pressure, release, valve within the body and specifically designed for for extreme energetic states of which kundalini is one. So the crying will come to a person. Uh, a person will also experience some mood swings. And this is all before a spinal sweep, which, once again, is the energy moving quickly and, and strongly from the base of the spine and, and, and fountaining out the top of the, of the, of the head, uh, out of the fontanelle, not spreading. So before this occurs, as the buildup to that major event is occurring, uh, a person may go through some mood swings. They go through some some levels of anger at not being in control of their body. Oh, my gosh, I'm not in control. You know, and you just kind of, you know, if you're one of these, you know, strongly self-disciplined people and you're going, how could I have been so out of control? Oh, and you just kick yourself for, for saying that or doing that, whatever it is. And uh, I want you to understand that the high levels of self-forgiveness are extremely important here. You are not in charge of your actions so much as you have been uh, before you started coming into the Kundalini in a stronger way. So, uh, you know, understand this. Understand that these mood swings are natural. Uh, you are not to hate yourself for this. You are to forgive yourself and you try to, to forgive and love and be as, as balanced within the emotional body as you can. Do not consume alcohol during these, these areas of kundalini. Do not do the drugs. Do not uh, follow the form and format of what many people who are not in the kundalini will often do with regards to trying to maintain a control or to force a state of consciousness on their body. 
uh, having an emotional issue, oh, let's go to the bar and have a few whiskeys, right? No. You know, having a hard time at work, oh, well, let's go, let's go to the pub and have a, you know, a few pints. A pint is a lot. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not going to help you. That will actually cause you to have some more problems with it. Uh, yes, and, and I, you know, no judgment against people who love to have pints. It's uh, for Kundalini people, for people coming into this extremely exalted spiritual state, uh, that may not be the best thing to do at that time. Okay, we're not judging people here for for what they do. One size does not fit all with regards uh, to humanity. Humanity, you know, people can have their wine and their booze and their drugs and whatever and not become a kundalini, and they can have it and be just fine. They can be just fine with that. So, But when you're coming into the kundalini, you're going to want to make some, some uh, changes. Uh, another symptom that we'll have as we're coming towards the spinal sweep this, this is very important. Entities. These are a discarnate consciousness. Uh, I'm going to label uh, uh, ghosts or uh, sp- spiritual consciousness that is not in a body. These become very attracted to a, to a person who is coming into the kundalini uh, the spiritual world understands the absolute power of kundalini. It's a very clear understanding. And there are many spiritual consciousness that will flock to a kundalini awakening person to observe this divine transformation. Okay. There are also many forms of, of discarnate. Discarnate means without flesh, so... So a discarnate consciousness means a, a consciousness that does not have a physical body. Uh, many forms of discarnate consciousness uh, will also come to try to uh, cause the person to experience certain forms of, of emotional expression. Sometimes it's fear. Uh, sometimes it's love. So, you know, they will try to inflict a certain program or a certain level of, of, uh, of uh, expression to the person. And so you may, because you're, you're coming into this and it's at the early stage, uh, it, it will seem you won't know what's going on, per se. Uh, sometimes you will. Sometimes you'll your kundalini will allow you to sense that, oh, this is a presence that is different than me. This this is another consciousness that is different than, 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 than me. And if you'll get to know this, not saying that you'll get to do anything about it at that point, uh, but you, you know, you'll know this, you'll understand this, and typically, typically, not always, but typically it will scare you. It will frighten you. We are not prepared by the by the society in the West to deal very well with discarnate consciousness or entities. Uh, and so this can be a real life changer. This can shake the foundations of your current understanding and belief in, in what is and what isn't and what should be and what shouldn't be. This will fall sometimes far outside. Of, of what your expectations would be. It's, and sometimes when our expectations fall to such a degree, it can it can wrap us into a, a very strong level of fear and denial and, and confusion. And, you know, it, it can be a very, very, very difficult uh, experience for a person. I want you to know something about this. Because you're having kundalini, you are a very, very powerful person. The entities know this, but they also know that you don't know this. And this is what opens the door to uh, 
any kind of uh, interaction they may want to inflict upon you or to generate with you. Most entities uh, of a, you know, that are coming at you due to Kundalini lie. They are not truthful, and they will try to manipulate you to do certain things in your life. Uh, they will try to control your life. They will try to take you over. Uh, imagine a medium, a psychic medium, um, sitting at the table and everybody's joining hands in a seance and, oh, spirit of the dearly departed, whatever, come in to me and speak through me. Well, this this is what happens to a Kundalini person times a thousand. And sometimes times a thousand different consciousness, but also to the degree of the power of, of the communication. And it's not because... Uh, you're all of a sudden becoming a medium. It's just because of, the, of what the Kundalini is is doing with you with regards to transforming you uh, into a higher spiritual being. Okay, you you are at the blend of the two worlds. You're at the blend of the spiritual and the physical, and so you get to live in both worlds. Imagine two circles. Now move the two circles closer together, and where those circles intersect. That is where the Kundalini person is. That's the third world. Okay. <laughs> Forget about it. the whole idea of, you know, first world, second world, third world countries, you know, that we deal, you know, we associate with levels of technology and poverty. The third world is the Kundalini world, and that that is a, a world that is created from the blending of the two. Uh, so, yeah, so these, these entities may come to you in your waking life. You'll see them coming out of the walls. You'll see them coming out of the floor. You'll, you know, you'll be sitting in a restaurant, and someone will be staring at you across the room, and boom, they're just gone. Or they, you know, they can do some pretty wild things to, to try to initiate fear within you. I'll, I'll tell you one just to kind of give you an example of, of what they try to do is you're sitting in a restaurant and minding your own business, say, reading a newspaper, you notice somebody's, like, staring at you, and you casually just kind of, like, glance over there. Uh, and they just, just as casually, will take the head off of their shoulders, position it on the table, and turn the eyes of the head so that they're still looking at you. You know, it's an entity. You're just like, oh, geez, you know, try to, <laughs> you, you have to laugh. Sometimes it's just like, oh my gosh, that was really, really fun. Uh, you know, you give them an A for creativity, but you don't let it scare you. It's easy to do. And they're not all there to scare, but many of them are. Some are there just to manipulate you, some are there just to ride you, which means they attach to you so that they too can kind of go through your Kundalini awakening experience and gain knowledge by parasiting off of your uh, experience, you know, parasiting, you know, jumping into your body and, and, and living with you in your body as you go through your Kundalini. This is quite common. It's very, very common. Uh, at this point, in your, you know, you, you start having this uh, this experience with the discarnates. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna feel extremely uncomfortable with this at first, unless you have this knowledge, unless you understand what's what's occurring. You're gonna be extremely uncomfortable with this, and you're gonna you're gonna look for the many, many, many different ways. To, oh my God, I'm possessed. How do I get rid of this this dark spirit? And you'll go to a psychic, which, you know, a psychic is typically a person that has, like, a huge cloud of entities around them. You know, and for a Kundalini person to go to a psychic is kind of like McDonald's uh, making a house call. You know, giving yourself to this, to, to, uh, this kind of consciousness that will want to feed off of you. So I don't suggest it, but, you know, you know, not all psychics are the same either. Uh, you'll go to a Reiki person, you know, and hopefully it's not a Reiki person that, 
puts their hands in the air and says, healing masters of the universe, plug into my hands. Well, geez, you know, that's just an invitation to all these discards to plug into that person's hands and then transfer themselves right into the body of whoever they touch or whoever they're waving their hands over. Okay. We, we can be so, so innocent in our, in our spiritual applications because spirituality is the great uh, unknown in, in the West. It's, it's an extreme level of unknowing. And even in the East with Taoism and some of the martial artists uh, areas, you know, they, because they're so affiliated with control, it's like, okay, you do this to control that, you do that to control this, uh, they, they miss or they just kind of choose not to, to deal with those aspects of the spiritual realm where they're not in control. So those don't get written down. And so those are, you know, and, and also, you know, when you, if you're a martial artist and you see everything as a, as a competition or a, as a way of, of uh, you know, predator versus prey, energetic exchange, uh, you know, this, this, is all, this will take you to, to some of the lower areas of the astral or the spiritual realm, but it causes a blockage from going further because your, your mindset doesn't allow you to. You always have to be in control. You can never surrender. Never say die. Never surrender. Always be the the gold medalist in the in the in the competition. Uh, not all of Kundalini is about competition. Very little of Kundalini is about competition. It's something something for the people in the martial arts uh, uh, understandings to consider. Martial art. First of all, let me say something about martial arts. It's a very, it can be a very, very positive experience. Martial arts, uh, they can give you levels of discipline and levels of confidence that other other uh, systems just cannot even come close to. Okay, so I, you know, and I've taken martial arts. I, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with martial arts and the ideology behind martial arts, and I, I, I applaud. Uh, martial artists and the teachers who who uh, teach martial arts to to people. Uh, it's a very 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 positive thing. But within the Kundalini context, it doesn't always cross over very well. There are lots of things that have to be surrendered uh, by the martial artist in order to to come into the Kundalini without damage. Uh, and by damage, I mean without a damaged site psyche or without a damaged emotional body. Uh, so these entities, this can really be a huge life change for people, uh, 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 shaking them to the foundation of, of their idea of the reality of life. And this is why I wanted to bring it up first. Often, very, very, very often, people will experience the entity uh, phase of the Kundalini. And very often, these entities will try to infect a person. They will try to control a person. They will try to possess a person. They will try to dominate a person. They will try to to do things with a person that the person wouldn't do with themselves. And you don't have to you don't have to buy into any of these these uh, inflictions. You don't have to at all. Uh, once you realize what is occurring, you have this information that I'm giving you right now. Once you know what is occurring, your knowledge is power. You now have power over those entities. And it's not to say that, oh, you can just lift your hand and whisk them away. No, 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 no. You have to understand that as you come into the blend, the blended world or the third world, the Kundalini world, you're coming into a completely different uh, environment. And this environment has its own animals, its own insects, its own plants. Entities are part of the environment of the third world. So just as when you walk outside your door, you're not able to, to eradicate the, the viruses or the bacteria that land on your body or in your body, just as you're not able to to uh, 
uh, clean off the different life forms that attach themselves to you, such as, you know, you're walking through this forest and a little spider might get on your pant leg or, you know, uh, you know there's, there's so much life in the physical world that we don't know that attaches to it. Everything from from bacteria to, to viruses to uh, minute insect life to fungi to – it doesn't have to be a bear, dog, cat, you know, or anything that we can see. And so just as we walk into our environment, we have those experiences uh, unknowingly. So will we walk into the third world or Kundalini world environment and have similar experiences. So you don't get to just wave your hand and say goodbye, all entities, you know, it's, it, it, you know no more so than you can walk outside and say goodbye, all bacteria." you know, as you walk barefoot through that puddle. It's not going to happen. Life, life will exist. And life exists in the Kundalini world, third world, just as it does on the uh, on the physical earth here. And in great plentitude. What you can do is you can force it to evolve a certain way. So as you adopt a certain uh, thought pattern. By virtue of all of your cells in your body are in, in a constant communication. When you adopt a certain thought pattern, all cells in the body adopt that thought pattern. All cells in your body have the ability to make a complete and total you. So you have about 17 trillion, typically, 17 trillion little yous that are making up the larger you. So let's use Centaur. Is she's here. So Centara has 17 trillion minor Centaras that make up the major Centara. And, you know, the entities may want to do, you know, they if they attach to Centara and she doesn't want them to attach to, to her, well, then she may adopt a pattern of thought or a pattern of activity that, that they won't respond well to her. You know, if they're feeding off of her experiences, well, then she just feeds them some food that doesn't taste good, and they'll just move off. Sometimes uh, the best route, rather than, you know, putting ice on top of your head or going to a, a psychic or a medical field or anybody, you know, saying, oh, you know, I've got... Uh, I feel like I'm possessed. If you go to the medical people and say, oh, I feel like I'm possessed, well, huh. hello, hello, Pat, in private housing. Okay. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be diagnosed as schizophrenic with bipolar, you know, positive tendencies. So I wouldn't recommend it, but it's up to you. But, I, you know, for me, I would not do it. Um, neither would I go to a psychic. Believe me, I, I went all of this. Everything that I tell you about in these interviews, I have gone through. Okay. Uh, with, with the entities, in many cases, you are forced by the Kundalini to evolve them. They are a constant reminder. You can feel them in your body. They'll flow from one point to another point. Uh, you can feel them in the body. They're a constant reminder that you must take a higher spiritual course. Uh, in Hindu, or actually in Sanskrit, there's a term called ahimsa, H-A-I-M-S-A, ahimsa. Ahimsa means to cause no harm, to kill nothing. Okay. Uh, and, and Kundalini will often, in a person, adopt a level of ahimsa, not only to, to corporeal life on this, on this world, but also to entity-based consciousness because in our five sense understandings of life, you know, it's if we don't like it and if, if we feel we're being attacked, well, then we're going to try to destroy it. And what the Kundalini will do is it will try to steer you away from thinking in that way, thinking in the form of, of destruction or killing or uh, violating another uh, 
consciousness right to exist, whether they're existing in you or on you or outside of you. So there is that. The other aspect of it is you have a constant understanding of how it is you evolve those around you. When you're helping to evolve something within you, well, you have an understanding about how your actions and your thoughts and your emotions uh, begin to evolve those around you as well. If you're a teacher and, uh, you you know, you're teaching uh, kids, well, every day that you go to school and you stand up in front of that classroom, those kids are seeing you on many different levels, okay, many, many, many different levels, not just visual, not just audio, not just tactile, but they're seeing you psychically as well, even though they may not. Uh, you know, understand how they are seeing you psychically. And so as a Kundalini awakening person, you are able to to determine your level of appropriate activity that will not only aid yourself in in your spiritual evolution with the Kundalini, but it also aids those who are standing or sitting or present within your Kundalini radiance. Your radiance is as much a part of your body as your skin is a part of your body. And as your radiance enfolds other uh, physical consciousness or spiritual consciousness, your actions and activities uh, begin to have a modulating effect on their evolution, just as well as yours. So please consider that. Now, the entities will often try to talk with you. They will do everything they can do to get their attention. In many cases, you'll hear them quite clearly. They'll scream at you. They'll tell you to kill yourself. Really, they do. Uh, There are different levels of entities. There are entities that, shall we say, are ethically challenged entities. And these ethically challenged entities uh, will do everything that they can do to cause you to have pain. Everything they can do. Uh, They will come to you in a nightmare way. They will tell you to kill yourself. They will tell you to kill your children. They will tell you to kill some stranger. They will tell you to steal. They They will tell you to do everything that you know you're not to do. Okay. And so, once again, this is why it's very important not to do alcohol. Alcohol strengthens uh, the ability of an entity to come into your body and to begin to control you through your desires. Okay. Uh, Santara, am I coming through clearly? Yes, you're coming through clearly, Cousin. Thank you. So are you, by the way, right now. So. Good. <laughs> So, as these entities will promote uh, and uh, coercive, uh, hurtful actions upon you, I will suggest that you immediately begin a, a, a crucible of reversal process. Crucible of reversal is that every time an entity tells you to do something horrible, You do something positive. You do the opposite of it. If you have to do anything. Otherwise, you can just, like, realize, like, okay, these are entities. These are are the Kundalini world mosquitoes. These are, I don't need to be bothered by this. Even though, yes, you'll hear them screaming in your mind. In your mind. You will hear them screaming. calling you names or or uh, trying to get you to do hurtful things. Uh, this is just a training session. The Kundalini allows you to experience this because these are the lower echelons of the ethically challenged uh, entity domain. You will move through this. This is a temporary place for you. Don't ever, ever feel that this is going to be the way it is for the rest of your life, because it isn't. And this, can, this typically happens three to four months, and then it moves on. Uh, if, if there is more of an attachment 
to learning uh, from this area, then, then, you know, you will have to stay there longer. Uh, but this is an area that will move on. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the entity thing in some other programs, too, but I, I wanted you to, to get your a foothold on this, especially for those of you who are just coming into the Kundalini uh, and you're starting to hear voices. You're not crazy. You are not crazy. Your experience of consciousness is being expanded. And do not, do not attempt to, to have a conversation with these entities. Do not, I don't care how friendly they make themselves appear. They lie all the time. Okay, they lie, they manipulate. And so and that's the challenge, you see. That's the challenge is to be able to see the truth through the lies, you know, to be able to discern. That's the lesson that you're being given. So do not initiate communication with these discarnate entities. Uh, do not do their bidding. Do not believe that, that if they say, I am God and you shall do as I say, do not listen to that. God will not tell you to do anything bad to yourself or another person. Neither will Kundalini. So, you know, in a way, by their fruit shall you know them. Well, this is something that you can use as a form of discernment. But a lot of them are pretty crafty. You know, they, they won't tell you to do anything bad. They just want to get a foothold into your consciousness. Yeah, they just want a foothold there. Because they know that they've got time on their hands. Your time in the body is finite. Theirs is not. So do your best to not engage uh, these entities for any reason at all. Just consider them uh, parasites, uh, you know, that, that eventually will fall off of you because of, of how you begin to move in through the kundalini. Uh, you don't need to put ice on your head to get rid of them. You don't need to put camphor oil on your body to get rid of them. You don't need to, to do any of the various uh, and many uh, home remedies or unguents or creams or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, religious equations, uh, uh, you know, go in the name of Christ, you know, typically doesn't work. Um, so don't don't try to get rid of them. The best thing to do is to ignore them. Really ignore them, and and move from them. And you know, it's, knowledge is power. You have this knowledge now. This power will really, really, really help you with regards to entities. Now I'm going to move to another area that can be extremely life changing. This is another. Kundalini symptom, and it is called a Kriya. A Kriya is an automatic body movement, a spontaneous movement of the physical body or the emotional body or the mental body or the psychological body or the spiritual body. Uh, the most observable Kriyas are with the physical body. And this is where quite often you'll wake up in bed and you'll find yourself in bed in a yoga position that you never you may not even be taking yoga and all of a sudden you, you've got this yoga position going on as you're sleeping next to your spouse and you know good luck explaining that to, to him or her <laughs> you know it could be kind of comical if you think about it but also it could be a, a, a bit frightening and surprising if, if this is not something that's within your normal practice uh, these kriyas or these spontaneous movements are given to the to the five bodies of human expression by the kundalini as a way of, of suffusing the body with the kundalini. So the kundalini will move you into certain positions that allow a harmonious flow of energy to go through the body. And this can be... Uh, in many ways, just a thought. A thought can cause a person to have a kriya. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I'm moving my phone a little bit. Is that causing noise? No, but you, you got a bit distant. But John has just told me the sound is very good, Chrism. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, everybody, my, my cell phone that I'm talking through is broken, and I'm literally having to hold it together with my hand here. And I, that's why I, I keep checking in about it. So anyway, um, with the Kriyas, uh, as you move spontaneously with the Kriyas, don't resist it. It can be very painful. Uh, just allow yourself to be moved. Sometimes these will be fast, fast movements, and you'll probably want to do those in private. Uh, sometimes these movements can look like a seizure. So I will definitely, uh, you know, suggest that you do those in private. You know, the last thing you need is your spouse or a family member or a friend or a housemate calling the authorities because they think you're having a medical condition. If it's looking like a seizure, that's a very likely possibility. So be advised that Kriyas are natural. Nothing is wrong. Yes, your body may flip and flop about on the floor. I'm not kidding. It may flip and flop and twist and turn on the floor. You may be grunting or making animal noises. It's another form of a Kriya. Do not uh, feel that you are sick or that you're possessed or that anything is, is going wrong with you. More is going right with you than wrong with you. It's just way outside of your expectation of events that would normally, you know, you would normally think would happen to you. Okay? Uh, so, Kriyas are very common. It's not 100% of people who get the Kriyas, but it's such a large percentage, just like the entity, that it, you know, it has to be considered a major, a major aspect of the Kundalini Awakening uh, equation. So when these creatures occur, don't resist, go with them. Now, remember, earlier in the program, I mentioned to you that the Kundalini is intelligent. You can talk to the Kundalini and say, Kundalini, I have to go to work and I can't afford to have I, I will lose my job if I start having Kriyas at work. Please, I will give you my nights. I will give you the time I have away from work, but at work I need to not have the Kriyas. And guess what? You will not have Kriyas at work. It is it is amazing to see that occur, and it's true. You will not have Kriyas at work, and, and it will live to the to its word. It will it is good. You can trust Kundalini. But you have to live up to your side of the bargain. If you start trying to resist those Kriyas at night, then then you're pretty pretty soon you're gonna have those Kriyas up again. Okay? I see I have eighteen minutes left. I wanna open it up to any questions some time that might uh, I'm gonna continue this in the next show, by the way, just so you know. Next week. Any callers, uh, Sajara? No, no live callers, Chrism, at this time, no. Any questions? There, yes, there's a question. Um, I don't know what to do. There's no reason in my life to be sad, but I'm crying a lot, feeling depressed. It's Vera. Um, okay. That's is it that's Vera? This is, this is from Vera, V-E-R-A? Yes. Hi, Vera. Hi, Vera. Uh Remember, remember about the crying. Now, often when we're crying, because all our life we've associated crying with feeling depressed, for the most part, you know. I mean, uh, see if you can if you can uh, relate to how many times you've been crying because you were in pain or depressed, as opposed to how many times you've been crying because you've been laughing too hard. And you know, you might find that the the, the pain and depression has a has much more of a of a foothold with regards to being connected to your tears. You do not have to be depressed with this. Often, with the Kundalini, the Kundalini will use the channels of, of sadness and, and crying to prepare a person to have bliss. Bliss is a very, very strong level of energy. 
energy on the person. And when the person is having bliss, they can only have it for a certain amount of time at the beginning because it really, it's, it's too much. It's way too much. And the body will start crying and heaving and, and shaking and, and in many cases sobbing, okay? It doesn't mean that they're sad. It means that they're channeling that excess energy out of the physical system. So I want to invite you, Vera, to, to realize that, that you're not having tears because you're sad. That's just what, you're, what you're, your normal consciousness is able to associate the tears with. Now, unless you've had a, an occurrence in your life that has caused you to be sad, a death in the family, or you, you know, you've lost your job, or you know, something that is, a, is sad, but if it's just out of the blue and you're having other kundalini symptoms, you know, I would like to see at least three other symptoms from you that correspond with kundalini. From a kundalini perspective, your tears are helping you. A lot of kundalini people complain, you know, they call up to me and, and they say, oh, my God, man, you know, Chris, I have this, this terrible pressure in my head, this pressure, pressure, pressure in my head. Well, one of the best ways to relieve that pressure is to cry. So, Vera, your tears are tears of grace. They are tears of goodness. They are not there to, to make you feel sad. Your ego is jumping to that conclusion because that's what it's known. Its whole existence is, oh, okay, if I, when I cry, I, I'm either hurting or I'm sad, and so... Therefore, if I'm crying now, then I must be hurting or sad about something. I just don't know what it is. It's the Kundalini, and you you don't necessarily have to come to that conclusion that you're sad or depressed. Embrace your tears. Thank the Kundalini within you for giving you the, the pressure release of tears. Tears come to us when we're laughing or crying. We have to have it. It is a, it is a, a balancing uh, expression of our of our emotional and physical body. Very very important. Very important to have the tears. So so I want to take this moment to personally bless your tears, Vera. Bless your tears. Thank your tears. Have the tears. Do not associate sadness with it. Matter of fact. If you can take a flower or, or a beautiful picture and just look at that as you cry and then really associate your tears with the beauty that you're seeing, you'll feel that you don't have to be sad. Sadness is not a necessity. It is simply uh, a lack of understanding about why the tears are coming. And there, I would like to thank you for listening to this program. Uh, are there any other questions, Santara? Um, I have no name with this one, but it says, are out-of-body experiences psychic phenomena or is something else? Uh, out-of-body experiences are they're definitely, they, they belong to the third world. Um, they belong to the blend of the physical and the, and the, uh, and the spiritual. Uh, they, are, they are natural. They are natural to our body. Every time... Anybody goes to sleep, uh, they leave the body. The, a certain portion of their consciousness leaves the body. The, the out-of-body experience often, you know, if you start doing it consciously all the time and you can feel the separation sequence, the waves that, that travel from the feet to the head really fast and form into a vibration, you'll hear that pop or that loud gunshot or thunder as you leave the body and then, you know, as you, as, you, as you go through the different levels of understanding that you're out of the body and that you can pretty much do anything that you want to do, uh, these can be precursors to kundalini awakening as well. Uh, astral travel or out-of-body experiences are very, very, very strong educational tools. And uh, they are psychic phenomena. But they're also physical phenomena because when you go through the separation sequence, you can feel. I mean, what you know, when I was, you know, back when I was beginning to take an interest in these areas, you know, I would I would generate uh, out of body experiences 
on purpose. And then later in bed, okay, adopt a certain position, do a certain breathing technique, and boom, there you go. And to to feel that, to, to know that, and to realize that is is the beginnings of an understanding of an extreme expansion in what is real. What we consider real is a matter of perception. And if you have a very narrow perception, then your your understanding of reality will in turn be very narrow. If you have a broad perception because of your experiences out of body and in the body, well, then your reality becomes extremely expanded. And you know that you can go to a certain place to be in the spiritual or astral realm that will give you a certain experience. And, you know, there'll be many, many, many different places like that within the within the astral traveling region. Uh, so, yeah, astral protection is a wonderful uh, spiritual and physical uh, phenomena, psychic phenomena. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would suggest it to everyone, everyone. You do it anyway. The only difference between... Uh, uh, Doing it with intention and memory is is not doing it with intention and memory. You still do it at night. It's just remembering it and then controlling it. You know that's very very cool. That is I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself through uh, my early uh, astral traveling, and so I recommend it to everyone. Uh, I used uh, when I couldn't when I, when I didn't have the way to to do it myself. I would use Robert Monroe's techniques. I found his to be uh, the most effective. The uh, the Hemisync, H-E-M-I dash S-Y-N-C, uh, and doing it in the daytime. Remember, I mean, people always associate astral traveling with sleeping at night. Well, it's just too easy to fall asleep. So if you do it in the daytime, set aside an hour and a half, well, you can astral travel on your lunch break. So you got a question at work that needs to be answered, but you can't you're not able to discern the answer at that moment. We just take it into the astral with you, and uh, you have help there, and that help will give you assistance. Uh, looks like I have eight minutes left, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave these eight minutes left. And thank you, whoever that was who asked that question. Astral protection is wonderful. Uh, Anybody else have a question, Amelia? No, not at the moment, Chris. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, next week, I am going to to uh, continue to cover symptoms. There are many, many, many symptoms, but I wanted to cover these symptoms uh, this week. Next week, I want to cover some more. Uh, and as promised in earlier shows, I will also be talking about Tantra and the many different forms of Tantra in a future show as well. I would encourage uh, everyone to explore their kundalini. Don't be afraid of the many areas of spiritual psychic phenomena that will occur. Do not be it. Don't be afraid of that any more than you're afraid of your finger. It's a part of who you are. You have to remember, kundalini is endemic and natural to the human system. It is as natural as the hair on your head and the, you know, the, your fingers and your feet and toes. It is not anything to be afraid of. And yes, it does constitute, a, you know, a big jump in a person's evolution. But so does puberty. Puberty is also a big jump in a person's evolution. And yet, are we afraid of that? You know, do we do we go? Do we take great means to avoid that? No. No, and it's, it's fairly understood because it happens to everyone that, you know, puberty is going to happen and we're going to learn from it and our voice is going to change and, you know, body is going to change. Well, the same thing with the kundalini. The kundalini is a spiritual puberty that allows us to come into the greater reality uh, when we are ready to have that. It, and it's just the fact that just like a six-year-old isn't ready to go into puberty and a 13-year-old is, well, not everybody's six, and not everybody's 13, and so certain levels of, of experience uh, with a person indicate that, that they are ready to have Kundalini, and everybody will get it. Everybody will get it in the time they need to get it. 
Karma, once again, coming back to karma, karma is a great determining factor on whether a person will have kundalini in this life, a kundalini awakening. Uh, I want to su- I want to suggest also that kundalini yoga is not awakening the kundalini. Doesn't mean that it can't happen when you're practicing kundalini yoga. I support kundalini yoga. I just don't want people to think that kundalini yoga is synonymous with kundalini awakening. It is not. What they do is they take the kriyas, as I described earlier. Uh, the kundalini will give a certain kind of kriya to a person. Well, what the kundalini yoga people did is they took those kriyas and they they organized them in a way and in a sequence that they feel will help uh, them to have a kundalini awakening. So kundalini yoga is really about... Uh, trying to initiate a kundalini activation or awakening within the body. And that does work sometimes. Just not all the time, but it does work sometimes. And it is a great, great, very positive yoga system. So I want to honor everybody who is doing the kundalini yoga uh, system, belief system. Uh, You don't have to wear a turban to do this. You don't have to grow a long beard. I'm sorry, Centara, but you don't have to grow a long beard uh, to <laughs> to practice Kundalini Yoga. You can just be the person that you are and and practice Kundalini Yoga or Hatha Yoga or Hot Yoga. If you do the Hot Yoga, make sure you you bring something to hydrate yourself with. Uh, but you'll also find that once Kundalini is awakened, you don't need to do any yoga. You don't need to do any yoga. But a yoga that I will definitely suggest with regards to unawakened or awakening kundalini is the five Tibetans. The five Tibetans are a vertical yoga system, meaning they they go up and down. They don't go side to side. And with, with kundalini, you know, it's an up and down process as well. You're not going side to side a lot. You're going either up the spine or down the spine, up the spine or down the spine. So the five Tibetans, if you go to uh, YouTube and just go uh, Chris and Kundalini on YouTube, uh, you'll find my channels there, and I do a couple of videos on on the uh, five Tibetans, and I will recommend those. I will also recommend meditation, stillness meditation, where you just sit in a chair, you sit on the floor, you put your fingers, your index finger and your fingertip and your thumb tip together, and you do a meditation, just following your breath, listening to your breath. Or you can, you know, I can give you a mantra. You can just say, Om. Oh. You can do those things. Well, I'm very, very, very positive, and I will be speaking on that subject as well. I would like you to know that I do have a CD for sale. If you would like to contact uh, Eileen, her email is eloro55 at yahoo.com, and she will set you up with a CD. Once again, her name is Eileen, and her email is eloro at uh, E-L-O-R-O-5-5 at yahoo.com. Or if you call Centara or you get a hold of Centara, she can also hook you up. Oh, I, we have a caller, Fashji. Can you turn off your... Um, yeah. Fashji, are you there? I am. Okay. Can you turn off what you have on in the background? Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, mute it off. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Great. You're through to prison. It's Hi, Fasti. Well, how are you, sir? (laughs) I just wanted to call in and commend you and Santara on a wonderful beginning here. I think this is this is extraordinary uh, to actually have this type of thing uh, uh, on on the the internet and to be able to bring it to. Uh, especially the, the new students that might have an opportunity. And so I just wanted to come on and say thank you. I love you both. 
That's thank it. You. Thank you, Class G. Thank uh, you very much. And, and thank you for partaking of that last shocking pot as well. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, yes, yes. yes. It, it, was, it, was most, it was most remarkable for me because, as I said, it was more of a deepening understanding uh, of the Kundalini rather than more of the um, phenomena. So we're going to get we're going to get cut off now because okay, the program I'm going. is finishing. I see you got thirty seven seconds. Us, bring us okay. back again. It was lovely hearing you. All right. Take care. Bye you bye too. now. Bye bye. You too, indeed. Everybody. Chris, if I could just give out the number again, um the P.O. Box number, P.O. Box two six six three, Santa Rosa, California, if anybody would like to send um, a contribution gift to Christopher Mitchell. Thanks indeed, everyone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Kristen, and I'd like to welcome you to the the uh, part two of the uh, conversation about uh, the spiritual and psychic phenomena. Uh, and I want to I want to stipulate that this is spiritual and psychic phenomena associated with kundalini activation or awakening. Last time I spent uh, uh, some of the, uh, you know, about maybe half the conversation about entities, and I'd like to continue a little bit there. The entities, just to recap a little bit, when the, when the kundalini comes to a person, they're opened up into a level of spirituality or a level of spiritual perception that allows them to have uh, conscious, real-time interaction with uh, non-physical spiritual consciousness. Uh, I, I use the word spiritual uh, kind of loosely. I, I, I would prefer to say, uh, you know, say non-physical consciousness, so to speak. Uh, when we when we're open to this new perception, uh, we're we're open to a new, uh, you know, to our conscious mind. We're open to a whole new uh, dimension of of conscious interaction. Not necessarily physical interaction, but certainly conscious interaction. And as you have this conscious interaction, uh, the the consciousness there that do not have a physical body, what I call a, a discarnate, which means without flesh, uh, the discarnate consciousness uh, will go out of its way uh, being attracted to your kundalini awakened status. It will go out of its way to try to make a contact with you. And I'm going to suggest that you do not do this. Do not do this. Okay. Many of these lower astral uh, discarnate, uh, they don't really have your best interests at heart. They they pretty much have their own interests at heart and, you know, levels of energetic harvesting or trying to control your life is a very, very common uh, experience that people newly awakened into the, into the higher energetic states that Kundalini brings uh, can experience. This is this, you know, this is something to be aware of. It's, most of you listening uh, may not have a teacher, and so this is what a teacher would tell you uh, if indeed uh, you had a teacher and, and the teacher knew about the, uh, the higher states and what the denizens of, say, the lower spiritual states would be. Um, succubi, incubi, um, hungry ghosts, things of that nature. These are what uh, uh, a person can experience uh, with, within these states. I just want to state that uh, the place where I'm living uh, is kind of partly a rescue center for for animals. So if you hear if you hear the birds in the background, well, you know they're just they're just being birds and, and sounding off as birds do, as well as the dogs and. The, the turtles are kind of quiet, so just just in case you hear that, I want you to know these are not discarnate, <laughs> definitely incarnate. Um, so continuing with the uh, discarnate uh, understanding, you don't initiate communication. 
it the, the discarnate groups, and you'll get groups of them sometimes. You know, they will come to you and they will talk to you. They will say your name. They'll try to get your attention in any way that they can. And I just want you to stay in the middle of the road, the middle path. Do not in, initiate uh, communication of any way. Do not look at them. If you see them, do not look at them. Just turn your eyes away. Looking at them, the visual communication is a form of a permission for for a contract of communication to be given. So do your best not to engage them in any way with conversation. Um, Santara? Yes, Chrism? Uh, am I coming through okay with this? I don't have anybody here to check what it sounds like. John isn't here, so to me, you sound okay. fine. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to call in, uh, the number is 347-934-0026, and let us know if the sound quality is uh, is up, up to uh, what we would like it to be. Um, so what the... The, uh, the discarnate activity or the entity activity, uh, do not uh, promote a communication. Many of these things, if you do, you know, some, some fairly unpleasant uh, experiences can be given. Uh, first of all, they will try to dominate your body. They will come into your body. Whether you, or not you want it to become a medium, well, you just became a medium. Okay. They will try to, they will pick your clothes up, they'll have you throw your old clothes away, they will rearrange the furniture in your house, they will, they will do everything they can do to begin to live a life through your body, pushing your consciousness to the side. So really, 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 it's important uh, not to, to initiate communications with the, uh, the lower discarnate community. The higher discarnate communities won't do that to you. They won't try to dominate your body. They won't try to manipulate you. Uh, what they will do is they will give you specific teachings when you're ready to have them, and those are typically of a benevolent uh, uh, expression. So the higher, the higher discarnate activity uh, can be beneficial to you. The lower discarnate activity or, uh, you know, the, the lower entity contact can be not so beneficial. It's you know everything has its pro and its con, and even the you know the the hurtful interactions teach you what you don't want to do. Okay, so so even you know even those lessons have a positive outcome if you survive them. Uh, so I, I really want to focus you know I, I want you to focus on the discarnate scenario simply because. That can really make you feel you're crazy when you're seeing things that other people don't see. That can make you feel very, very, very insecure about the competency of your, of your, uh, of your consciousness. And I want you to know that you are not crazy. You are fine. You are healthy. You are having kundalini. And kundalini opens up a whole new dimension of interaction. And, and that dimension has its own uh, forms of life, its own its own consciousness, and some of the uh, first areas you'll run into are the lower uh, astral areas and, or, or the lower spiritual areas, and these areas are, are dominated often by discarnate or, or low-level entities that, that have malevolent uh, expressions. Uh, so... Just know that, be aware of that, and, and, and do what you can to not initiate a communication. I don't care if they're screaming at you, which they do, or cussing at you, which they do. Uh, just ignore it as best you can. Ignore it. And what I would do is I would go into a mantra. Om Namah Shivaya Om. So that Om Namah Shivaya Om, or any you know any other mantra that is positivity based. 
Uh, if you want to contact me and, and tell me a little bit about your situation, I can go ahead and assign a monster to you. Um, my contact email is K as in Kundalini Fire for All. That's K F I R E F O R A L L at Yahoo.com. Feel free to drop me an email and let me know a little bit about your situation. Um, so, entities are part of the deal. Kriyas are also part of the deal, and I, I may have been, uh, touched on those last time, but I'll do so again today. Uh, spontaneous movements uh, that resemble yoga postures uh, will happen to a person with, the, you know, in this stage of the Kundalini. So don't be surprised if you wake up at night, in the middle of the night, uh, you know, assuming a, a yoga posture, it's okay. It's fine. It is natural uh, for the Kundalini. And I, I want to reiterate today that Kundalini is natural to your body. It is that natural expression, just like breathing or, or you know, swallowing or your heartbeat. It is as natural as your heartbeat. And so your body is wired to have it. It is programmed to have kundalini. And the, the kundalini and the body know very well what is to be done. It's just your conscious ego mind that really doesn't have an idea and gets a bit upset over these new changes that are being kind of forced upon the ego mind. So you'll have a kriya. And the kriyas can come in shakes. You can have shaky kriyas where you're, your body is just shaking, almost looking like Alzheimer's or a palsy, uh, which it isn't, but it resembles that. So once again, you know, you don't need to run off to the MD, but if you want to, you know, certainly feel free to run off to the MD or to the ER and tell them that your hands are shaking or your legs are shaking or, you know, you have, uh, you know, the many different forms of, of uh, body positioning that the kundalini will put you into. Uh, but on the other hand, if you know you have kundalini, there's no need. Nothing is wrong. The kriya phenomena is there to infuse the body with the kundalini, and the body's response to kundalini is that automatic positioning. So it is absolutely natural and nothing for you to be concerned with. Um, some of the other... Uh, um, symptoms that, that I'd like to talk with you about is, is weight loss. You may have some unexpected weight loss as, as the body begins its transformation and the rewiring of your body begins, you may have weight loss. You're, you know, a lot of it will be due to, your, to the fluctuations you'll have in eating and in the, the changes in your digestion rates. Okay? So don't worry about this. This is okay, too. Yes, I, I know. I know this may be of some of, of some concern. Like if you're a very very thin person now, and oh my God, I'm I'm losing more weight. You know, I must have some sort of a disease. Well, you don't have a disease. You have kundalini, and it is not a disease. And it knows your body better than you know your body. So just surrender to this new phenomena and allow yourself to be at peace with it. Now. Some of the uh, initial uh, phenomena that will occur right after a, a, a huge bolt of energy that goes from the base of your spine and out the center of the top of your head, uh, a lot, uh, it, it's like electric ants or electric snakes are, are moving all over your body, and these are the this is the energy of the kundalini uh, being. Uh, detected by the hair follicles along the skin. And it's, it's extremely tactile, and it's very, very pleasant. I want, to, I want you to know this is very, very pleasant. It feels really good, and it feels so good that you'll want to encourage it naturally. You're, you know, your, your mind will go, oh, my gosh, that feels so good. I want, I want more of this. And so the, the, these fizzings and the zapping that goes on all over your body and these, these – uh, electric uh, vibrations, uh, these are all natural uh, to, the, to a person having that first spinal sweep, that first bolt of very, very strong conscious energy that's going up the spine 
and, and fountaining out the top of the head through the fontanelle, which is aptly named for this purpose. So understand that. Understand this. You will have this tactile experience. And this is pretty much across the board. These symptoms that I'm discussing today are pretty much shared symptoms for people that are having uh, the kundalini. So you could, you know, you'll have them at different times in your process. One person may have kriyas while another person's having the entity experience. Uh, but it, you know, eventually, you know, you'll, you'll get a little taste or a large taste of, of many of these different phenomena. So for the kriyas, Kriyas will typically take about a three, three months to, you know, to a year. Um, sometimes they can last for, for eight years. And some of the Kriyas uh, can be of an electrical origin. I mean, they can be so strong that this electrical blast will, will affect you at the base of the spine and literally throw you out of your chair. Yes, yes, it's, it's very dramatic and it's very surprising and it's, it definitely wakes you up in the morning. Um, I say this just to let you know that there are different kinds of phenomena that are energy-based, and the Kriya phenomena is, of course, energy-based. Uh, but sometimes that energy can be very, very, very strong, very, very strong. Uh, just like the little fizz, fizzes and the, and the you know, the electric uh, ants or snakes or whatever you, whatever analogy you want to use with them, you know, as they zip and zap uh, over your body and through your hair follicles, uh, you know, some of the more powerful pulses of energy that can come from the base of the spine will feel electric uh, in origin, even though they're not. It is kundalini, but it feels electric. And, you know, it can toss you kind of across you know, out of your chair and in and around. And, and so you just want to be aware of this. Once again, this is natural. This is not unnatural. And it will last for as long as that person's individual equation requires that it lasts. Typically, these different stages of kundalini phenomena are transient, meaning that they have a start point and an end point. Uh, the end point is more of a blend, though. I mean, the start point is pretty, uh, you know, it can, it can start out slow or abruptly, but it, it's fairly different than anything that you've had before. And so your sensation of it should be sharp and very contrasting to, to the way your body had been before, you know, these, these phenomena come. But after, as these, as these phenomena continue, they, they can wear out a little bit, and then they just slowly, slowly, slowly blend into the next phase of your Kundalini awakening experience. So, so the electrical kriyas are, I call them electrical only because they feel that way. And also the, the fizzes and zapping that kind of sound and feel like a, of a, a, an electrical origin as well, that course through your body and through your scalp and your hair and and, uh, you know, your skin everywhere, everywhere, all over your body. These, these little zappings and represent a rewiring of your, of your energetic anatomy upon the physical anatomy. So the physical anatomy is being changed uh, by the presence of the kundalini, uh, which is an expression of the energetic anatomy. So as these changes occur, you know, uh, one of one of those uh, symptoms uh, that will be due to the rewiring is the weight loss. Um, these also, you know, you may have energetic spasms in the in the major and minor organs. So you, you literally, your kidneys might start to vibrate. They might start to vibrate. You'll feel them move. You'll feel them spasm. It's okay. Nothing's wrong. And it's not painful. It's just it's like you feel it. You're like, whoa, what was that? Because you, you're not typically used to feeling your kidneys move around of their own uh, volition. And so it comes as a surprise to a person as when they experience that. And the other aspect with the kidneys is as you have the kundalini, certainly in the beginning states, the kidneys will expand. 
expand at least one-third of their normal size larger. So you will definitely begin to feel your kidneys uh, you know, at your belt line. You'll feel them expanding over your belt line. And, and yeah, it can feel a little – you can feel concerned because, you know, you know, people often will jump to the conclusion, oh, my God, I'm getting a kidney stone. This is what I did. Oh, my gosh, I'm getting a kidney stone. You know, and, and that's such a painful event that you really want to go out of your way not to have one of those. And so I wouldn't blame you if you went to the medical uh, 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 industry and, you know, told that, that uh, MD, it's like, oh, my gosh, I think I've got a kidney stone forming, and, and they'll want to image that. You know, they'll want to take a, uh, an image of it just to see if indeed that is, and they won't see one because you're not having a kidney stone form. You're having kundalini. And kundalini infuses the tissue in such a dense way. I mean, it's a, it really, really infuses every molecule of those kidneys. And, and so, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll definitely feel the kidneys in a different way, but that will recede. But what organs that are sitting right on top of the kidneys, well, they too, they're also going to get infused uh, uh, with kundalini, and these are the adrenal glands. And so the adrenal glands will start to, to spasm, and as they spasm, they will produce more of the, uh, of the fight or, or, or flee hormone, ad adrenaline, that into the bloodstream, and, and all of a sudden you become very, very paranoid, or you become very, very fearful, or you, you're very, very... Uh, you have a lot of anxiety for no reason whatsoever. You could be sitting and there and listening to the the most calming strains of of, uh, of music, you know, something that's very meditative, very slow, and all of a sudden you feel anxious and you, feel, you have anxiety and fear and paranoia. And that's because of the adrenaline that's being pushed into your bloodstream by hyper-expressing adrenals due to the kundalini. So once you know this, you can relax a little bit and just go, oh, okay, that's the kundalini. And the thing that I'll ask you to do is to not drink any caffeine. Do not eat or drink any caffeine. Caffeine will, will hyper-express the adrenaline already being hyper-expressed by the kundalini. And this really, really can, can put you over the top with anxiety and paranoia and fear, and you just don't need that uh, when you're having the kundalini. It's enough that you're having the kundalini. You don't need to make things any stronger uh, by having caffeine, and it certainly doesn't improve the experience. So don't have any caffeine. Stay well hydrated. Uh, look at your electrolytes. Uh, if you, have, you know, coconut uh, water is great. Coconut milk is great. Uh, watermelon, watermelon juice. These things are the, are the nutrients that the kundalini awakening body requires. Uh, stay well hydrated and keep your electrolyte balance uh, intact. Um, and, and even if you have to have Gatorade, you know, which I, I can't, uh, you know, if you have none of the, uh, nothing else that I mentioned, but you do have Gatorade, Gatorade is fairly well distributed. Uh, even that would be better than nothing, okay? It'll keep you balanced, and it'll, and it'll help uh, with the adrenal and the kidney uh, functioning, even though, you know, you're metabolizing red, blue, yellow, dye, number, whatever, you know. Uh, it's better than, uh, than not having the, the needed electrolytes that you, that you will need during that type of a, during that part of the kundalini infusion. So really, really look at your hydration, look at your electrolyte levels, and, and don't have the caffeine. Don't have any of the hot spices either. Uh, you know, hot chili spices or some of the hot Japanese food spices. 
the the the, the yellow mustard Chinese you know food um, um, none of that stuff none of the hot chili spices that you have with Mexican food and and I know that you may have been partaking of this and I said oh it's not hot to me I'm just fine with it well that's it's not so with the Kundalini and this can also precipitate uh, some some greater temperature issues that you may feel with regards to the Kundalini. In a way, I'm going to suggest that you go to very, very bland food. Uh, no, um, you know, white flowers, no, no industrialized white flowers, no industrialized white sugars, no stimulants of any kind. Okay. Uh, be very, very pure with what you eat, and as raw as natu- as you can naturally get, uh, raw vegetables, raw fruits, things of that nature. Uh, and this this goes for those who are trying to initiate a kundalini response as well. You know, start going into the into the bland food diet. Um, so, you know, these are some of the more common things that will happen. Uh, you know, the energetic spasms uh, in the organs will, will also express throughout the, uh, throughout the body. So the heart will spasm. When the heart spasms, it, it commonly goes into a tachycardic rate, which means very, very fast, fast heartbeat, extremely fast, and, and uh, enough to cause you concern. Once again, Kundalini will do this naturally. Your heart is wired and programmed to have this happen naturally. Nothing is wrong, but I do want to encourage you to go to the ER if you feel you need to have a stress test. If you feel that you're having a cardiac event, fine. You are having a cardiac event, but it's a kundalini cardiac event, which is different. Uh, it will Kundalini will modulate your blood pressure. Uh, it'll make it go really high or really low into you know what what uh, would be considered some of the dangerously low areas, but it's not dangerous for you because it's Kundalini that is doing this, and Kundalini once again knows you better than anybody else knows you, including yourself. So the energetic spasms will happen with the heart. Uh, conversely, it can also go very, very, very low, extremely low heart rate, and you'll you know. They'll wonder how you're able to get up out of a chair. But once again, this is natural for for the, the uh, a Kundalini cardiac event. So it's all good. But it's all good. Your nostrils will dilate to an extremely wide. You'll never have thought that your nostrils could dilate so wide. And they will do that. They will do this spontaneously. Uh, you may have little um, spasms in and around your eyes. The, uh, the ring muscles around your eyes. Uh, your eyes are surrounded by ring muscles. And uh, these ring muscles will spasm, and so it'll look like you have a tick for a little bit. And I know, I know that that can be disturbing because people, you know, if you're in a job where people have to look at your face, they'll have to wonder, they'll think something's wrong with you. But nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong. This is just part of the infusion of the Kundalini. So the energetic spasms will affect your digestion. Uh, they will they will travel into the you know into the liver and into the kidneys and into the stomach and of course the intestines will spasm. Uh, any of the ductless organs will will spasm uh, and and vibrate and it's it's fun. It's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. nothing wrong is happening. It's just extremely different, and the different, you know, that constitutes an unknown, and so, you know, we can often go into fear over an unknown, and I want to to suggest that you do not need to go into fear, uh, because you know now, at least some of you know now, that it's the Kundalini. The Kundalini will go into the ovaries and into the vagina and into the testicles and and the uh, the, the uh, generative organs of the human being. Uh, in the males, uh, the Kundalini will pull 
uh, uh, pulled semen from the testicles automatically. So for the men, uh, you need to just allow this to happen. It'll pull that generative fluid from the testicles straight back into the spine. Okay. For the women, it'll 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 pull uh, the 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 fluids of generation uh, from the from the uh, reproductive organs straight into the spine. Okay. Not the egg so much. Not that, but everything else uh, uh, of a fluidic nature in the in the uh, organs of reproduction in both men and women will be pulled into the spine and used uh, by the Kundalini uh, as it changes it into a plasma, and this this energetic plasma is disseminated throughout the body, uh, initiating and, and supporting the transformation of the body that's occurring. So and again, you know, in a way, you're being you're being reborn by the Kundalini. You are being changed, literally, on a physical level, by the Kundalini, as the Kundalini uses uh, combinations of of uh, combinations of of what the body already has within itself, such as the the uh, the fluids of generation or the fluids of reproductive generation. This will be used as part of, of a format of transformation for the human, human being. So don't be surprised if you feel that. Men, you will definitely feel this. Uh, it, it feels strange. Uh, uh, and, 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 and ladies, of course, the ovaries will be vibrating and moving and spasming as well. And so you will also feel this. It is, it is nothing to be concerned with. You are not having a medical problem. But, of course, if you wish to go in and and uh, have those areas looked at by an MD, you know, I, I, I'm supportive of that. Uh, so these energetic spasms uh, will, will go all over the place. One of the things that I really want you to do is to keep that tongue tip up behind your upper front teeth. This is a Taoist uh, practice that really helps uh, the person to stay connected with the upper and lower and the front and back uh, levels uh, of the energetic anatomy. Uh, you know, once again, you know, you'll, you'll hear this from people, oh, you know, such and such a teacher, you know, he said that, such and such a teacher, he said this. And This is from the Taoist. This is like thousands of years old. No current teacher within the last hundred years has ownership of any of these techniques. Kundalini owns these techniques, okay? Not the ego consciousness that, that you know, that, that like to feel that they own anything that they say. Um, pretty much everything I'm telling you is owned by the, by the Kundalini. So, so I want you to know that, and I want you to know that, that uh, your Kundalini is the most knowledgeable source of information that you can, that you can partake of. Now, uh, these energetic spasms, uh, you could call them uh, minor kriyas uh, for, the, uh, for the, the different systems, you know, the human body, the muscular system, of course, we've already discussed. But now, you know, with the, the, ma- the major and minor organs, you know, the eyes, all of these things. But it also goes into the emotional body. So all of a sudden, oh, my gosh, you're going to have these tremendous mood swings from absolute jubilation, joy, ecstasy, extreme love, to severe depression. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, don't get tied up in the depression. It's too easy for us to do that in our society, the Western society. So be very, very clear. You're, you know, you'll have the highest of the highs, but as you, as you migrate away from the highest of the highs, the lack of those of those qualities of bliss will cause you to, to go into the lowest of the lows, very, very low depression. And this is natural. This is the Kundalini broadening uh, your your the, the dynamics of your emotional experience, broadening the horizon, broadening the experiential levels 
of of your emotional body. And so it is just the way a, a person stretches their body for yoga. Well, this is this is emotional yoga that the Kundalini is bringing you. So don't be surprised if you know you have these really 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 highs and low low lows. And no, you are not becoming manic depressive. It's not anything like this. You know, don't don't feel that it's schizophrenic or bipolar or any of that stuff at all. And if you go to an MD, they'll typically give you that kind of a diagnosis. They don't have anything else. You know, they don't have anything else. So, you know, so, oh, wow, okay, that, that looks kind of like bipolarism. Well, let's just call it that. You know, that's what they do when they leave the office after examining you. They go run to their books. And they look up the uh, symptoms and what they correlate with, and they come back to you with their best guess. Okay. So with that in mind, Kundalini is not to be diagnosed as bipolarism or schizophrenia or, or any of the other uh, psychological um, um, catch-all diagnoses, you know, that they really don't know what's going on, but here's my best guess. So with that in mind, your emotional body is being uh, rewired and reprogrammed at the same time as your, as your, as your physical body is being uh, rewired and as your, mus- you know, the muscular system, the digestive system, the, the, you know, all of the different systems of the body are being rewired and often at the same time often you'll have these moments where everything is kind of being changed at the same time and you just got to understand it and just kind of like, okay, okay, I surrender to this, I surrender to this. And it will go much better for you. Much, much, much better for you. Uh, so, you know, covered these energetic spasms, uh, not so much in the spiritual body. The spiritual body will not necessarily have this. But the emotional body will, the physical body will, the mental body will. And and the mental body aspects of these energetic spasms would be uh, periods of extreme clarity, periods of extreme creativity, periods of extreme uh, um, brilliance. And And I have to use, I mean, you become a savant. Okay, you are a savant. You you have these moments of incredible intellectual brilliance. Uh, You'll have things come to you. You'll have knowledge about subjects that you've never studied. You'll be able to speak languages that that you've never studied. You'll come up with theories and and, and different aspects of of knowledge uh, that are extreme, that are extreme in their in their brilliance, in their in their in their level of, of you know level of of incredible intellectual prowess that that really surpasses anything that you've had before, and then you'll have these experiences of extreme dullness where you you just feel really dull. You'll just feel like, oh my God, I, where did the brilliance go? <laughs> You know, what happened? Uh, and, and, you know, this is also just the same as the emotional body. You know, where you're feeling really, really good and then you're feeling really, really depressed. Well, with the mental with the mental body, you'll be feeling really, really, really smart, and you will be, and then you'll also be also very, very, very dull. Very, very, very dull. I won't say ignorant because you don't ever get that way so much. You just feel really slow and dull. And, and uh, once again, that's the... Uh, the, the poles of of the uh, of the intellectual body uh, being uh, widened, that horizon will also be broadened. So once again, it's natural. You're not becoming stupid. Okay, so you just you know, and eventually, it will, these will all even out into a level of of a, of a natural expression as your Kundalini equation matures within you. But see, these are some of the more surprising areas that you can have within the first three to eight years. Um, Let's see, moving on into the ego body. Okay, 
Well, the ego is gonna it's going to experience a lot of these things, and it's just going to go nuts with fear. And I want you to understand that you don't need to be afraid of any of this. This is natural. Your body can have this. Okay. The ego will will spasm, and your psychology will will in many ways fracture. Uh, you know, and you'll you'll have to reevaluate what you have thought life was about, what you have thought your your life goals were, what what you have thought that your priorities in your life were, and, and the ego will, will struggle with this. And I just want you to take control of your ego. Do not let its fear corrupt your kundalini awakening experience. And it will try to corrupt it. Every new thing that comes along, you know, whether it's a, a, an energetic spasm in the body or, or a kriya or anything, it's going to go into fear. Your ego is what will take you over to the ER. Oh, my God, something's wrong. So I want you to realize that your ego body is really going to spasm, and it's going to cause you to experience levels of fear. And this is natural. The fear is also natural. Fear of the unknown is a natural quality. But I want you to overcome it. And I want you to overcome your fears. Do not let them make your choices. Do not let fear make your choices for you. If you have been meditating, if you have been doing yoga, if you've been doing kundalini yoga, if you've been doing Vikram's yoga, if you've been doing hatha yoga, if you've been studying a martial art, if you've been, you know, praying devoutly, if you have been doing any of these things, and in some cases, if you haven't been doing any of them, kundalini just comes to you, well, this is kundalini, and this is natural, and you are okay. You are not unhealthy. You are very healthy, healthier than you've probably ever been, uh, whether or not it feels that way. It's, this is a great jump. This is a great, great step in your evolution as a, as a human being. You know, uh, you're becoming, an, uh, your body is literally being changed uh, into the kind of a body that, that comes with enlightenment. And so I want you to understand that. And I want you to understand that in the, the whole enlightenment equation is a multiverse of, of all of its own. And it's, what it will do is it will take your kundalini equation and apply its equation on top of that, and the, the, the body functions, the mental functions, the emotional functions, the ego functions will all be changed in order to, to uh, partake of the levels of enlightenment that will be coming for you. Okay? So this, these are a little bit, of, of the um, some of the other uh, symptoms that you can have, your eye color can change. If you have blue eyes, you might just start having green eyes. Uh, this is not uncommon. Uh, your hearing uh, can can really really expand tremendously. You can hear a fly landing on a picnic table, you know, 50 feet away. Uh, it can be very very dis disturbing because there is so much more sound out there than, than our, our hearing normally really records. And so, wow, to, to hear such things is, is amazing. Uh, you know, you can hear bubbles coming up in a lake or, it, yeah, it, it goes beyond my ability to describe. If your, your hearing can become extreme. And then once again, it will, it will it will disappear a little bit. So as that, as, as the uh, symptom for the ears uh, expands and decreases, your ears will also feel like there's a pressure change occurring in them. Uh, they, you may feel soft, ticklish kind of movements going into the ear canal and into the brain. Um, it will feel like very, very thin fingers are, are going into your ears and all the way into 
to your ears, and, and you'll feel pressure, pockets of pressure uh, uh, develop uh, within within the, the brain space and the ear space specifically. Uh, and this is, once again, part of a kundalini manifestation. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, I felt like there was a little bit of welding, you know, a little soft welding going on inside inside my brain, just to tell you what a hard case I was. Uh, you know, and this, this kind of disturbed me, to be honest with you. I, you know, once again, my ego, this part of my uh, awakening, would look at that and go, oh, this is just not right. <laughs> Nobody should be welding inside my head. I don't care how soft and gentle it is. So, you know, once again, you want to you get a hold of your ego uh, a bit on this. Uh, the, these, these very, very, very thin fingers of energy will come into your ear. And as I said, it's slightly ticklish. And, and you can rub your ear, and it'll stop for a little bit, and then it'll just come right back in. So I, I, I just have to let you know that it is persistent in its uh, applications to the, to the ears. Uh, and this this will happen for a while. Don't uh, don't be upset about it. It will it will happen for a while. Just kind of get used to it. You will feel this uh, this uh, pressure pre- pressure difference, you know, over either ears or one ear. You know, it doesn't necessarily happen to both ears at the same time. Uh, one day it'll be the left ear. Next week it'll be the other ear, um, and then. You know, it'll be different areas of the of the of the inner cranium where you will feel these 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 pockets of a of a different pressure. It's not painful. It's just noticeable. It's noticeable. Um, many of you, as you come into the kundalini, you will feel the the golden helmet effect, which basically follows the the hairline. Whether or not you still have a hairline, men. Um, it doesn't matter. It will still follow that hairline. Uh, this is this is con- this is this is something that is uh, male or female both. Uh, you will feel like you're wearing a helmet or a hat or a bowl over your head all the time. You'll just feel this, and this is a natural thing. This is not unnatural at all. It is part of the Kundalini equation, and not anything to be surprised. It's if anything, it's something to be thankful for because you know, you know, it's giving you a very explicit understanding that you are on this path. Okay, and you'll you'll feel it all the way across the nape of your neck. It'll come up uh, around your ears, and, and it'll you know, for men, it'll follow your sideburns. And, uh, not often will it follow the beard line, but it'll definitely follow. It'll go up from, like, say the the. Uh, the ears, and then on up across the forehead and around around the uh, the hairline that way. So just be advised of that. It's okay. It's natural. Nothing is wrong. It's called the golden helmet. You can look that up. Uh, so your your hearing acuteness will really increase, but so will your visual acuteness really really increase. You'll be able to kind of like have this weird zoom lens type of thing where you can. You can zoom in on a on a bug or a, or a dewdrop on a on a on a leaf, or be able to, to sometimes go into things with your vision. Interesting, it's like a medical viewing in a way where you. What happens for me is the skin of a person's body just disappears, and and the system or the the injury or the disease that I'm looking at is the thing that comes up, and yet I'm able to see surrounding tissue only to the degree that, that it helps me give service to that person. So your 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 vision increases and it's and you'll you'll feel a a like a third eye mechanism kick in. And so not you no longer have two eyes, you have three eyes, but the third eye is a spiritual viewing eye and it doesn't have the same kind of limitation that the physical eyes have, and yet, so what it will do is it will lend itself to the visual acuity, and all of a sudden, your visual eyes 
will no longer have the same limitation. And uh, uh, moving into the into the eye area in the third eye, you'll often feel an inside outside uh, pressure or bump occurring at your third eye, almost like like a, a, a small mound of energy is bubbling up from where your third eye is. And, and this is a tactile feeling. You will feel this. You won't be able to really control it for any of these things, to be honest with you. All of these, most of these uh, uh, phenomena is in the control of the kundalini, not the human ego consciousness, just so you know. So remember to surrender to all of this. As the third eye is being stimulated by the kundalini, this bump will occur, and it's a blessing. It's a real blessing. It doesn't hurt. Uh, sometimes it actually it feels quite strong, like there's a horn, you know, like you, you, you're growing a unicorn horn, uh, but you're not. It's the stimulation and the beginning of the opening of the third eye region. And once again, the third eye will lend itself to, in equal measure, to, to the, uh, to the physical visual eye. And this will begin to give you a, a much broader, um, appreciation of the dimensional blend of, of the visual world. Uh, so, for instance, when I say dimensional blend, is you can see entities. You can make uh, you, 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 your vision can can go inside of an object that hasn't been uh, opened up to you. You can go. How do I say this? You can you can visually bilocate uh, in ways that are far more than just bilocate, which indicates two. You can bilocate to to a hundred different angles and directions and you can go inside a room. You can, I mean boy, some of these are really hard to put into words. You can uh, really you can see molecules. You can see you can see the the, the way the physical universe is connected. Not just see it, but feel it and know it. And, and uh, it just goes beyond words in some way. Uh, but this isn't all the time. If this was going to happen to you all the time, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't really be able to live in society as you must do. Part of the reason you're here is to have this while living in this Western society. And so blinders are given to you. Not blinders. Blinders not isn't the word. Uh, filters. Filters are given to you so you can drive a car without seeing any of the remnant dead people that are that are standing or lying in the roadway. Okay? Kind of That kind of should give you an idea of what I'm talking about here. Uh, to be able to see discarnate consciousness, uh, not every discarnate consciousness is, it, you know, it's so diverse in, in its in its uh, in its application and its in its residual effect. So, for instance, a person is killed on the highway, uh, you may still see the the imprint of that body laying in pieces on the highway. And, and this would cause you some great distress and uh, could cause you to have your own accidents. And so filters are given for you, and the kundalini allows you to have it only when it feels that it, it is necessary for you. And once again, it is this, this higher power, this higher uh, spiritual divine consciousness that is coming through you and helping you and guiding you. And so with the visual, with the visual matrix of three uh, organs of visual uh, uh, intake. Uh, the third eye lends itself to the to the physical visual eyes, and this is what allows you to see in very, very, very different ways. Uh, but vision is a very complex thing because it also constitutes communication. Uh, 
on a spiritual level, it also constitutes uh, permission and contractual agreements and things of that nature. Just by observing something, your kundalini will ride that vision. So what I'm saying is vision has weight. It has weight, and it is a physical force and a spiritual force at the same time. And so the kundalini will ride the beam of your cogency that you have with your vision. So if you're looking at a tree, well, you're looking at the tree and your brain is is formulating uh, what you know of as a tree. And that formulation itself, that process itself, is being directed at the tree. It's like a... <laughs> if, you, if you're watching any of the... the the science fiction movies, they'll have a, a a sensor scan. Oh, Captain Kirk, we're being scanned. Well, that's what you're doing when you look at that tree. You're scanning the tree, and the tree will feel that scan, or the entity will feel that scan, or the other person will feel that scan. That's why when, when, you're, when you're spying on a person, and, uh, you know, this in the West... <laughs> In the West, it's typically described as, you know, when a, say, I, 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 I don't know if I should use that analogy. Well, yeah, when you, when you spy upon somebody and their back is turned to you, uh, they'll feel like there's somebody looking at them. And they'll turn around and they'll go, what? Who's there? Because they feel the scan of your vision. They feel the scan of your consciousness uh, that's writing the vision. And in the kundalini case, they'll feel the level of kundalini on that vision. And so will the animals, and so will the plants, and so will the insects and the fish. All life responds to kundalini. So therefore, the life that you look at with your eyes will uh, flow with kundalini, and they will know. They will know. And uh, and. Uh, a contract is made. Um, so the eyes, you get a lot of different phenomena with your eyes, and you'll process a lot of different phenomena with your eyes, your physical eyes and your third eye. When I say eyes in the Kundalini context, I'm talking about the third eye, the top of the pyramid, and the two eyes, which, which form the, uh, the base of the pyramid on either side. So that will occur. Um, your sense of taste will come and go just like the hearing and the and just like the mood swings that will come with the body. So don't worry so much about that. Do remember to keep the tongue up, tongue tip. Uh, let me go into the tongue a little bit here. The tip of the tongue, uh, there are five uh, that I know of. There are, there are five, probably more, uh, tongue positions that can occur uh, besides the, you know, including, I should say, the tongue behind the upper front teeth. Uh, so you'll notice that there's a, if, if you go into your soft palate right now and you explore that with your tongue, you'll, you'll notice there's the fleshy mound right behind your upper front teeth, which is the typical place where I would suggest that you put your tongue tip. And then there's, there's the, uh, as you slide the tongue back and it'll dip in to that soft palate and there's kind of like a, like a, an indented area or an area that is that goes upwards more towards the uh, towards the top of your head. And that is another position. Well, you have different positions for your tongue tip to occupy, uh, all going all the way back to Kachari, where the Kachari uh, mudra or, or lingual mudra, tongue mudra, uh, will go back into the nasal. Uh, uh, of the upper nasal areas, and, you know, that kachari is basically uh, for partaking of of uh, brain dews as they drip off of the pineal gland or pineal sweat. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people think that's, you know, the, you know, a big deal. And I guess just for them it is. For them it is. You don't have to. To uh, to partake of that, it's not bad. It, it, you know, it's you know, it's great. It, and as it touches the tip of your of your tongue tip, you know, expansiveness will occur. 
but you know, I, I I don't really suggest people try to to go back there. Now the Kundalini may force your tongue back and up into Kachari, and that's a different deal. With that, then you must surrender to the Kundalini. But to try to do it consciously, or, or for those who are trying to have Kundalini, to stick their tongue back up into Kachari, thinking that's going to bring them Kundalini, no. No, no, no. That's more a natural Kundalini response than it is something that you do to try to produce Kundalini in the body. Okay? So there are many tongue positions that occupy the upper palate of, of the human being. But the first one is really... Uh, the tongue tip behind the upper front teeth. Okay. And what happens if you don't do that and you have Kundalini is you'll get a tongue tip burn. And it's this is a real thing. I've had this, you know, all of these things I've had happen. The tip of your tongue will burn. It's like it will it'll be similar to what it would feel like if you if you put your tongue on an ice tray out of the freezer. That kind of a burn. And it will last for a while too by the way. So I really, really, and it's not, that is one of, that one can be painful. I, I found that out the hard way. That, that that one can be painful. And so I will suggest that everybody put the tongue tip up behind the upper front teeth. Okay, just so, so you know about that. And I already talked to you about the nostrils. I also want to say with the nostrils that inside the the upper lip, of your nostril, inside it, about an eighth of an inch. There are the the chakras there where the ida and pingala terminates. So when you're doing breathing or you're doing pranayama, the ida and the pingala are are stimulated. This is what happens when you get too hot, where then you you know you plug the the right nostril and you breathe in through the left, and vice versa if you're cold, or you plug the left nostril and you breathe in through the right. So so the scenario is, is those chakras under the upper lip uh, of the nostril, those are fairly powerful chakras. And this is what will cause, often, your uh, nostrils to extremely dilate. Okay. So once again, this is, this is normal. Uh, going back to the eyes, you'll, you'll understand that sometimes your physical eyes will be pulled up all the way up, almost like they want to go into the into your brain, falling into your brain. Let that occur. Except, you know, don't, not while you're driving. But let that occur if you're seated and you're in a safe place and you're meditating, whatever. The eyes will want to go up, and I want you to really surrender to that. Let them go up. Let them go up. Don't worry about it. It's natural. The kundalini is pulling them up. Okay, pulling them up to the brow points. Now, you may experience posture changes uh, and skeletal realignments. Your postures may become more yoga, yoga oriented, uh, and because your your new postures are coming into you, your your skeletal system will begin to realign. Um, you may feel, as you, as you have the Kriyas at night or anything like that, you may feel your bones kind of moving of their own. Well, they're not moving of their own. They're moving because the Kundalini is moving them. Uh, sometimes you may feel some sharp pains where your joints are as the Kundalini moves through these areas. Uh, you know, there's corrections being made. And as as you do not resist, it will go easy. If you do resist, it can be hurtful. I just want you to know it can be hurtful. Um, so uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, the wrists, you know, the wrists or the elbow or the shoulder. Uh, if you're used to tying your shoes a certain way, and the kundalini comes into you, and, and all of a sudden, you cannot tie your shoes the same way that you have done before, since you learned how to tie your shoes. You have to learn a new way to tie the shoes, and, and this is very important for you to learn this new way. Uh, 
Because if you don't, any other way, the, the way that you've used to, to have done it will cause you pain. And so you learn through this avoidance of pain how to tie your shoes a different way, and then the kundalini will finish the, 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 uh, the alteration of that part of your body. And then you can go back to doing it the old way if you wish or continuing with the new way if you wish. But this will go through throughout the skeletal uh, realignment. So just be aware of this. Just because you're feeling pain doesn't mean anything is wrong. It just means sometimes that you have to do things a little bit differently. Remember that you have kundalini. Remember that. You have kundalini, and kundalini changes everything. It will change your posture. It will change your skeletal alignment. It will change your joints. It will change the amount of synovial fluid that's going in to lubricate your joints. It will change all of it. Okay? So understand that and realize that and go with that flow. Go with the flow. Don't go into pain over this. Cranial plate migration can occur. So your, uh, the, your skull is made up of different cranial plates. And they're they're uh, joined by ligatures or these these little uh, lines of joining that you see on a skull. If you look at a skull, you'll see the different cr- cranial plates, and, and uh, they're joined by these ligatures. And these ligatures are where the plates meet, and the little lines of demarcation that you'll see on top of a of a skull uh, and on the sides of the skull and. Kundalini will change that. It will begin to reshape the top of your head. You can feel this sometimes. Don't worry about it. It's natural. It's okay. Kundalini is refocusing the top of your head to support the flow that is a part of it and coming out and through it. It is, it, it'll typically reshape it around the fontanelle. So, so don't be surprised if you feel the top of your head kind of moving or if you notice it moving after a while. You know, you, you feel the top of your head, you crush your hair, you wash your hair, you know, you feel your head, you know, every day. And you may feel things starting to be a little different then. Don't be surprised. Don't be afraid. Nothing is wrong. Okay, cranial plate migration will occur. And it's not the end-all, be-all either. Just because you have the cranial plate migration doesn't mean that you're done with the deal. It just means that it's part of the equation. doesn't mean that you're getting smarter either. <laughs> the bone structure of your, of your cranium doesn't really uh, uh, mitigate intelligence. That's the mental body. The mental body will do that. And, yes, the, the kundalini will make you smarter in that sense. Um, so the cranial plate migration can occur. It doesn't occur for everybody. But it occurs in, for enough people that, that I felt it important to mention. Um, all the ring muscle groups can experience hyperdilation. Everything from your rectum to, to the... Uh, the mouth, the nose, the eyes, the ears, the, uh, the nipples, everything, uh, uh, even the, the inguinal muscles, the uh, uh, you know the ring muscles of the of the organs of generation, reproductive organs. Uh, all of these will have periods of hyperdilation. It, it's nothing to be shocked over. It's just part of the process. Um, and these are, what's these, you know, the ring muscle phenomena, except for the nostrils, it tends to be over fairly quick. It's not long, long, long lasting. So, so it's one of the quicker phenomena that will, that will uh, come and go. All of these phenomena will come and go. They are transient. They will not stay. Uh, some of the kriyas will stay, like the electrical kriyas for, for people who are 
prone to have the electrical Kriyas. My electrical Kriyas went fairly quickly. I mean, they stayed long enough for me to <laughs> feel them and, and 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 have an intimate relation with them. But uh, but you know, some people they they they're there for years and years and years, and and uh, they have uh, kind of like a sine wave of uh, peaks and valleys. So, but most most of the uh, of these phenomenon I'm telling you about will have a have a a starting point and an ending point. Um, your perceptual acuteness uh, in all the areas of your perception uh, will merge with the new divine knowledge. This is a level of knowingness. And I mentioned it a little bit uh, when I talked about the mental body where you'll know things that you you haven't studied, you know. You'll know all about subjects that you have no business knowing about those subjects, but you'll know them nonetheless. And this is part of the divine knowing, the the, the knowingness of the divine, and, and Kundalini is of a divine source. And so, you will begin to partake of teachings and understandings that surpass your studies that surpass your life experience. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. And you just, depending on how broad your psychology has become at the time that you experience it, uh, not always is it, would it be considered from our ego understanding the blessing, uh, you know, knowing that there's going to be a, uh, a huge accident or an air accident or, a, you know, a friend is going to pass because of a certain thing. Uh, yeah, it will expand it into precognitive channels of expression for some people, not for all people, but for some people. And, and in that sense, it, it, you know, you know, that's kind of a, of a difficult blessing to have. Uh, but for the most part, the, uh, the expanded level of knowingness, of divine knowledge, is an extreme blessing and something that that, uh, that I will suggest that you embrace. Really embrace it. Really let it let it happen for you. Um, moving on with some of the uh, obvious symptoms, your your left big toe will turn black or blue for some of you, not all of you, but the sore big toe nail on your left big toe will turn black, and it, it almost like you hit it with a hammer or something like that, and it, uh, it's natural. You haven't done anything to it. It is a sign or a signature of the sacred kundalini as it, as it begins its process on your body, so know that. Don't do anything with that. If you see it, just let it go. It'll pass. It'll pass. But this is one of the signatures of Kundalini on, on the body. So I, I, I did uh, mention that you will be hyper-emotional. You'll have extreme joy. But with that, you'll have this extreme unity, which is joy and knowledge of your unified position within creation, uh, you'll feel at one with God. I cannot explain to you the, the magnitude that, that that statement represents. Easy words to say, but the experience itself is stupendous. It's fantastic. It's wondrous. It's amazing. It's it's being at one with divinity, and this this has to be experienced. I can't really any of my explanations or explanations of it are are pathetic in in comparison to what it is. I, I'm just going to have to leave it at that because there's nothing nothing words can say that will give it appropriate explanation for you. So you'll have God consciousness. Some people call it God consciousness, but for me it's you are at one with God. You're at one with at 
one with God. Um, so, so know that, uh, understand that, feel that. What you will also have is a continuous experience of love. You will love everything. You will fall in love with everything. That tree that we were looking at earlier, you're going to fall in love with that tree. The bugs, you'll fall in love with the bugs and the, and the trash and the litter on the side of the road. You will fall in love with it. I remember, as I've said many times, and I apologize to you who have already heard it, uh, I remember sitting in a hot car on a freeway in stop traffic, uh, no air conditioner, looking out the open window at the oil spots on the side of the road and going, oh, God, those are such beautiful oil spots. They're such artwork. It's God God is speaking to me through these oil spots on the roof. So, I, <laughs> so just so you know that, it, you know, this love is amazingly expansive, amazingly expansive. And, and this level of love will 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 happen for a while, and it's what will give you that continuous smile. I don't know if you've seen pictures of saints, and I know that some of my students have this already. They have a permanent, peaceful smile on their face all the time, except when their job doesn't let them have it. You know, some jobs, you don't want to have that constant smile on your face it's because a smile communicates something that maybe is, is different than what you're, what you're hearing. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Centara, are you still hearing me? Yes, I'm still hearing you, cousin. Okay. <laughs> 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 Talking to this empty mic all day. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Centara. All right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you'll have this amazing experience of love, and this will elevate. You'll be thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, this love is amazing. And then, then you come into bliss. And bliss, bliss can't happen while you're driving. You don't want to have bliss while you're driving. Seriously. Pull over. You can't really do anything. You're just, you're not even really, you're there, but you're not there. Bliss and ecstasy are, you know, they are part of the Kundalini experience. And they're, they're blessedly, they are a, a recurring theme within the Kundalini experience. And yes, 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 it feels really good, amazingly good. Like God consciousness, I can't really put a quality in words that will sufficiently describe what, is, what happens with that. But you must, when you have the bliss, your tears will flow, and the bliss will ride the channels of joy and sadness that your body uses to to relieve pressure. And those tear ducts are that mechanism that the body uses to relieve pressure, you know, strong emotional pressure. And you will just, the, the tears will flow. And with the ecstasy, ecstasy is even worse, in my opinion, if, if something so good could be called worse. <laughs> ecstasy is amazing, and you just, with ecstasy, you just have to stop. You have to surrender completely. It will come on to you, and the bliss will come on to you, and you just have to stop and surrender. And with ecstasy, you may experience memory loss. Uh, sometimes when I've been having a seminar, I will have bliss or ecstasy during the presentation of the seminar. And when I come back, and I literally mean that when I come back, I sometimes don't know where I am or what I'm doing. And I have to ask somebody there, it's like, what was I saying? <laughs> and hopefully they'll they'll tell me it's just like oh you were talking about such and such. So yeah, the ecstasy and the bliss are extremely powerful, extremely powerful, and, and these are direct divine communications. And you shouldn't be surprised to find out that divinity communicates you through levels of extreme love, 
mean love. And once again, I cannot put words to it that will appropriately describe what happens, but it's really, really good. It feels really, really strong. You're pouring out tears the whole time. Uh, your body is heaving, literally heaving. I don't know if you've seen little kids when they cry and they, their chests are just heaving with tears. Well, that's what's happening to you, except you're not crying through pain or sadness. You're crying through love and joy. And so this, this is very important. I do want to mention the, the seminar. Uh, Santara. Yes, prison. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned it I thought... your name. I mentioned... <laughs> so a gathering is being developed for uh, Lake Tahoe on April 21st, Santara? Uh, it's starting on Friday the 19th. Starting on Saturday Friday the, the 19th. 20th. Mm-hmm. Going through that weekend to the 21st uh, of April 2013, um, this is in California, the Sierra Nevada of California. Very, very beautiful place. Very, very wonderful place for Kundalini. Um, I want to invite everyone who is listening to this broadcast to try to make the arrangements to come. I would like you to to email Santara at uh, Kundalini Awakening System 111 at gmail.com or Kundalini Matters at gmail.com. That's one word, Kundalini Matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, at gmail.com as well. And, uh, or, or you can uh, communicate with myself directly at the kfire for all at yahoo.com and uh and basically I will, I will i will give it over to centaur because she's the one. she's the point person on this and i want to invite you all to come to this i will be giving shakti Pad. i will be be uh giving diksha i will be giving ishta invitations um I will give you as much as I can possibly give in that tiny, tiny amount of time. I wish it could be three weeks, three months. But that could be really, really expensive. So, so you know, to, to keep the expense levels down, um, uh, three days is, is what we're planning on. Uh, you will not need to, to bring your own food. The, the place has its own chef and all of that and uh, they have uh, very nice accommodations and you'll be with other Kundalini people which is which is such a rare and beautiful thing to experience anyway you know even if I'm not coming at the the people that are there the people that this kind of an event can attract are extremely beautiful wonderful people to be around and so I would I would really encourage you to to come to come and so once again that is April 19th through the 21st, 2013, it will take place in uh, the Lake Tahoe area on the west side of the lake. Uh, uh, this is around beautiful, beautiful tall pine trees, and uh, it's about a quarter mile from the lake. It's its own, I forget what it's called, but it's a beautiful place. Um, uh, Aaron Centara is, yes. is in charge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, Sorry, Chris. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I keep thinking you're you're addressing me. Okay, I'm zipping it. Apologies. So, so you can reach her at Kundalini Awakening Systems one one one. That's the number one 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 at gmail dot com or at Kundalini Matters. K u n d a l i n i m a t t e r s at uh, gmail dot com as well. So. So uh, be advised of that. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go with some more symptoms here. Sometimes of a visual of a visual experience is called the glistening, where a white frosting of light or a silver how do I silver gold glistening frosting of light will be over everything, everything, the, the leaves, the trees, the gravel, the cars, the Everything will have this glistening of light over them, and 
and once again, you're not going crazy. You're, you're, you're having visual experiences. You'll also have audio experiences where you'll hear things. Uh, you'll hear crickets. Sometimes you'll hear a million crickets, or you'll hear bees, the buzzing of bees. Uh, you'll hear all these things. You may even hear the birds that I have in the back. <laughs> Can you hear them? I can hear them. <laughs> I was just thinking that's a little bit what it's like sometimes. <laughs> it's like I'm in the Amazon. I, I'm getting you from the Amazon. Um, so you'll hear many, many different things, including your name being called sometimes. Uh, you may hear echoes, like if a car goes by, it'll, it'll go, whoosh. you'll hear it go by, but, it'll, but for you it'll go, whoosh. So you'll have a like an audio elongation of, of an audio event. Uh, so this is this is uh, natural. Don't worry about it. You may have a desire to be naked in nature, and this is something that I've discussed before in some of my videos. Make sure that you have you know if you have this desire and, and it's natural, and it can be strong, very strong to be to be natural in in the in in, in nature. Uh, make sure that you're not going to be observed by anyone. Okay? Be alone. Women, be very careful with this. Um, I hate to... Men, be very careful with this too. Uh, but just make sure you're in a safe place and you're alone. Okay? Uh, you may feel like you have to fast. The Kundalini may force you to fast. Go with that. Uh you may uh, want to practice the safeties daily or yoga practices daily. Go with that. Uh, I'm having to speed it up here because I'm running out of time. Uh, you may feel like you're merging with everything. Surrender to that. Surrender into your enlightenment. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is an enlightenment format. Kundalini is all about bringing you into your level of enlightenment that you can have in a body, in this life, right now. It's a lifetime commitment, which is why Kundalini does not go away, ever. It does not go away, ever. And so I would like to thank you all for listening to this. looks like I have a little less than a minute left. Uh, thank you for dealing with our sound issues or our, all the animals here. Thank you. Uh, for listening to them. Uh, thank you, 